So we're back for the second session on Argo's Eye Painting. A lot of the sort of excess oil or turps which we used in the first session has now evaporated off, which gives us a great opportunity to put down a lot more paint to really hit our tonal values and to sort of you know, push the painting a lot more. So first things we do when we come back is we check to see if it's sunken in. And by checking to see if it's sunken in, you're essentially looking to see where on the painting the paint suddenly looks really matte and lifeless. And although that is a perfectly normal, natural part of painting, what it does do is it means that when you're looking at your painting and putting fresh paint down, is you're making judgments off something which isn't the true value of the paint. Depending on your approach for the next day, you can either oil out, retouch varnish, or just paint completely over. Um, we don't have a huge amount of sinking in, probably sunken in a little bit here on the darks. So you'll probably find that most sections of the painting which do sink in tend to be around the darker areas. So because I know that I'm going to re-hit these areas sort of very early on in the day, I'm not that worried about oiling out or retouch varnishing them because I know I'm going to get a, basically a fresh layer of paint over the top. But if, let's say, I was just working on this little area here, I would definitely put some retouch varnish on before the session so I can make judgments based on the proper value of the paint. And if you are to going to retouch varnish or oil out, and oiling out is essentially a really thin layer of your medium sort of over the, over the painting, if you are to do that, oiling out, generally speaking, what I would do is make sure that you're putting fresh paint down on there or you're taking it off at the end of the session. Otherwise, you can end up with a sort of gloopy, quite uncontrollable amount of medium over your painting. But for retouch varnishing, because retouch varnish generally has quite a lot of terps in it, you want the paint to be pretty much touch dry, but also you want to leave it about, you know, 10, 15 minutes before you start painting. So come in before your model, retouch varnish, get everything looking lively, and then let the turpentine uh, evaporate a little bit. You're still gonna have that little bit of layer of varnish, and then it's gonna be easy to work on without having to battle against that layer of turps. So what I'm gonna do, first when I attach, attack, this for the second session is, like we did last time, is go back and re-establish our shadow shapes. Each time I come back to a painting, that's the first thing I do. Not only does it help make sure that your structure and the shapes are working well, but it also mentally sort of forces you to sort of put paint down where in many ways you think, ooh, I quite like that bit of paint. I quite like what I've done there. So you're sort of almost battling through your natural tendency to, to be a little bit timid when it comes to change. So you want to always start with that sort of you know, notion of uh, intent by putting, putting the paint down, making sure that those edges are nice and wet so you can work into them. So I'm going to re-hit them and then because we've got this much more sort of receptive surface now, I'm gonna re-hit my darks, re-establish my value range, and go, from, go on from there. So when you get the model back up, it's really important to make sure that the pose is the same as what you've been working on. Because otherwise you constantly find yourself chasing and redrawing and ultimately making far more work for yourself. Remember, you wanna be as efficiently lazy as possible. So if you can get everything sorted before you start, it's gonna make life so much easier. Like with yesterday, I've got my three mixed, pre-mixed colors for my sort of semi-open palette. I think as you get further along in the painting, the idea of the pre-mixtures become slightly less integral because I think you wanna be slightly more reactive to what you're seeing on the, on the canvas and on the model. 
but also bear in mind when you're working from life, colours change due to the, the weather outside. You know, if whether the models run in because they're running late, whether they, there are variations. So the key is you're looking more for relationships in the in the subject rather than necessarily constantly chasing every uh, every change and a bit of variation you see throughout the days. So what I'm doing is re-establishing the edge of my shadows. I'm not putting an opaque layer within all my shadow edges. I'm just making sure that if I want to play with that edge, that I've got paint which is malleable enough to do so. And so it's not a thing of creating this sort of opaque shadow layer. If anything, you want the shadow to be a little bit thinner. So it breathes a little bit more and you build up the opacity in the lights. Now, yesterday, as you can see, probably from the slight change of the painting on how we left it to how it is now, is I wasn't particularly happy with the placement of the mouse and the chin, and so I softened it. I probably maybe even over softened it a little bit, but it's going to force me to go back into the, that part of the painting and really reanalyze and try and reestablish what I essentially failed to do yesterday. And I think what generally you find is certainly after the first session, is that even the darks, even if the darks and the lights you thought you'd sort of really established and nailed your value range, is you can tend, or you tend to find that you can probably come back and push them a lot more on day two. So with the mouth, so I'm really looking for what parts of the lips are in shadow, what parts are in light, rather than drawing these sort of Valentine's Day sort of smooch style lips. We don't want to over emphasize a sort of separation of lips to, to the rest of the head. Because ultimately, yes, there's a slightly different local colouring to the lips, they tend to be a little bit redder, but that's generally because there's a slightly thinner layer or less layers of skin over the top of it. So see it more as, you know, if it's light, it's just part of that transition of light. And you'll find that also colours wise, they tend to be a lot more subtle than people give them credit for. Often, Certainly with beginners, you see these very cut out red lips, which have this sort of lipstick style effect. And again, even at this point where you feel that you're getting quite, you know, deep into the portrait, is you're still looking to keep those shadows incredibly simple. Like with an Alla Prima or a longer pose portrait, the information you lose in the shadows essentially gains intrigue within the lights. So I'm going to be treating the moustache and the beard as a shadow for the most part. But certainly with stuff like the nostril wear, I want to keep that edge a little bit softer than what I've got at the moment, so I want to get that nice fresh layer of paint down so that then when I start to turn that edge I can manipulate it from both sides of the transition. So I could probably be using a slightly larger brush for this, for this section because obviously you want to be using a brush which is suitable for the mark you're making. And as I was going round the other shadow edges, the smaller brush made sense. And I started putting in a little bit more tone for the beard. Probably should have moved to a larger brush, but at the moment still just back, you know, jumping between re-establishing our shadow edge and massing in. So being a little bit lazy here, getting a little bit of lift off because We've still got quite a lot of 
oil underneath. So what I'm going to have to do with that is just use more paint. And often when you when you do get lift off, which is essentially when you're putting trying to put down more paint, and you find that actually all you're doing is taking paint off. Sometimes there is nothing you can do about it. Other times you just need a little bit more paint and paint slightly more opaquely. So let's stop myself being too lazy and start using larger brushes for larger areas. Certainly with something like the neck, as you will find that if I'm focusing on just painting the neck, is it's going to appear to be a lot lighter than it actually is. What you want to look, look at when you are trying to judge or view the tones of these more sort of periphery elements of the portrait is look at the brightest bright and then almost use your peripheral to make a judgment on, on the tones when it comes to, to stuff like the neck. So that's probably still even a little bit too, too light on that part there, but I just thought I'd mass it in a little bit, get an indication for where I want the collar to go. And maybe a slight indication for the Adam's apple. And you'll find that certainly when it comes to sort of shadow edges along stuff like the neck, is you can be a lot softer than what you think. What you often see and often sort of, in my opinion, sort of pulls, pulls back the quality of a lot of portraits is neck, shoulders, ears, as I spoke about yesterday, which don't have that observed quality which the rest of the face does. So not only are you trying to get it nicely observed, but you also want to get it so that it fo so works within the overall focus of the piece. So now make the use of having that more receptive surface and re-hit your darkest darks and re-establish our value range. So yesterday when I was trying to put this kind of tone down, it became a lot thinner, didn't really sit on the canvas as well. Now it's starting to sit a lot more. I can get that variety in the hair. I can push those darks and I can then sort of slightly re-evaluate re my lights. How light or dark do I want something to be? I think most people tend to either start a painting with a very sort of under hit tonal range, whilst, you know, there are the odd few who go the other direction and go with a much sort of darker base of everything and then find they have to lighten everything. So I think it's always good to kind of keep in mind what your habits are when you're painting and whether that's when you're painting a grisaille or whether when you're painting an ala prima or a full, you know, a, a longer pose portrait, is the more you can sort of slightly preempt the, the tendencies which tend to be sort of recurring in your work, the easier it is to change them nice and early on. And I think so often Certainly when we're doing you know, a limited palette or a full palette portrait is that the idea of colour can throw off the control of tone. So this is why doing something like a gazai is such a great exercise or way of starting a painting. So you can basically do a whole grisaille painting and glaze in some colour, which keeps, keeps everything a little bit more restrained and controlled but also probably doesn't really lead to that much, I guess, uh, leniency when it comes to making design choices on the fly, because you tend to then feel that you've 
slightly undone all the hard work you've done underneath. But I think it's such a great way of getting people to understand, A, the importance of, of tone. Because I think certainly nowadays we are bombarded with the idea of colour when it comes to sort of television, when it comes to movies, when it comes... I mean, that when we start to paint, we're almost more focused on colour over tone. But actually, to get that sense of form, to get a likeness correct, it's not getting the perfect colour harmonies in, his, in our model or, you know, landscapes. But it's more actually getting the tonal values correct. If you get the tonal values correct, you can paint him green and blue, and he's still going to register as him, as, as a understood and observed portrait. And you get sort of a couple of fantastic artists who are sort of good examples of this. I think uh, there's a painter called Glenn Brown who does essentially reimaginings of, or has done reimaginings of master, master paintings, but with far more wackier uh, color palettes. But because the tonal values make sense, the portrait still very much holds together. So if anything, you know, color should be a sort of secondary byproduct of the painting or focus of the painting, whilst tone is always that primary. So now that I've rehit on my darkest dark, what I should probably do is rehit my lightest light. Because even by looking at it, you can kind of think, well, it seems, seems pretty bright to me. I don't really need to change a huge amount. And then if you put a, a sort of a fresh bit of paint next to it, you can suddenly go, actually, maybe it does need to change. So it's difficult to really tell straight away. See that, I'm mean, probably a little bit light anyway, but it does very much suggest how much I can still push, push those lights. And you can make decisions on how subdued or suppressed you want your tonal range to be. But I think to give yourself a nice sense of leeway when it comes to modeling, to getting those half tones and those transitions correct, you don't want to suppress it too much. But ultimately, once you've established your value range, as long as what you've put down works within this world that you've created in the same sort of manner and relationship that it does in nature, regardless of the, the compression which you've, you've gone for, you're still going to have a sort of understood and worked working painting. So as you work up your painting, you're going to find that some of those in, initial markers and tones you put down don't quite register in the same, same way they did. So you might have to go back, double check them, make a few adjustments. Like I say, that's perfectly normal. You're not going to get things 100% right, right at the beginning. What you want to do is also make sure that you don't have certain parts lagging totally behind. So I need to work on the ear, the collar, figure out how the background and the hair really sort of add into the, the portrait a little bit more whilst obviously reassessing what I've got down in the face and those relationships. So with the ear, like I mentioned before, it's, it's really important not to let the highlights which we see in the ear overpower what's going on in the rest of the head because the ear tends to be a little bit darker, it's set back a little bit, and obviously it being surrounded by the hair in the background, we've got a dark background, those highlights are gonna jump out a little bit more visually than what their actual sort of tonal value is. So we can be quite, quite cautious when building up these. And it's quite, quite easy with the ear and, and in the external contour, contour of the hair, neck, is to get into the trap of being a little bit linear with it. You know, we're painting whilst we start off relatively linear, in the sense that we start off geometrically putting down these straight lines. Bear in mind we are describing a mass of form 
rather than a walled structure. So I'm trying to keep the tonal shift within the ear apparent, but not overpowering. And sometimes that is easier said than done, but we'll give it a go. But again, a lot of it is how much information do I need to put down? You know, if I've got quite a broad and simply painted face, if you then draw every single little shift in, in tonal variation in a sort of secondary focal point like an ear, it might drag the viewer's attention over a bit too much. So figure out what you need to put down, what you want to put down, what you're trying to describe, and try and get a little bit more warmth to the lobe of the ear. Whilst I want to have it lighter, just introducing a little bit more umber into that mix. Like with any contours, you also then have to sort of think, how is it, how is the contour of that reacting and relating to, to the external contour? So it's quite nice. I think the ear is wrapping round quite nicely. Shapes need to be a little bit more specific to, to him. So not quite his ears at the moment, a little bit sort of generic there. Time is almost up. For me when it comes to this painting i'm going to start to think more about you know the effect of the painting overall where i want sharper softer edges where i want the sense of focus to be so you can spend as much time as you like on a painting don't sort of get caught up to the idea of it's taking too long, so it's no longer, you know, has the same sort of value or something. The idea of having to sort of churn out paintings within a certain time frame for it to be a success is something sort of, I think, driven purely by sort of social media show-offs rather than people actually worrying too much about the art itself. So it really doesn't matter how long it takes someone to make a piece of artwork, regardless of how large or small it is. So don't feel the need to sort of rush yourself. Take your time. Keep going back to those simple, larger, larger shapes, and you can just keep pushing it until essentially you're happy with it. And I find certainly with clothing is try and work as much as you can again with straights and go for those larger folds, those larger, more sort of repeating. And when I say repeating, I mean, you know, if you're painting over a couple of sessions, where are those bigger, bigger shifts which happen every, every time your model sits down? Because those are going to be the one which is describing the form underneath. If you are permanently trying to draw every little crease, every little sort of um, fold on a shirt or something, you end up often with a slightly sort of formless, sort of wet plastic bag kind of look in my opinion. So <laughs> keep it simple, try and work broadly, nice, simple straights. Again, you also don't want to sort of, well, you might, but generally speaking, you're not focusing on a portrait of a shirt with a man in it. You know, we're heading, we're trying to get a portrait of a man in a shirt rather than a shirt on a man. Therefore, it's really important to try and figure out how the shirt is describing the form underneath. And I know I'm literally just painting a collar, but I thought I would talk a little bit more broadly about the idea of painting a bit of drapery. And I'm, I'm gonna use 
jumper as one of my darkest darks. Vignette the head into. So I want to suggest the shoulders without them pulling up too much tension at this point, certainly because it's so closely cropped to the head. It's very much a head study, so. And then slightly lost some of those highlights and variation on the, on the shirt. So again, going in with nice, simple, straight. Oh, might be a little bit too, too bright that one. And if you do go a little bit too bright, you can always knock it back afterwards. So, as always, if your paintbrush is getting sullied a bit, sort of muddy, you're losing the clarity of what you're trying to put down. Grab a new one. So these highlights in the shirt bouncing up way too much. So I've got a shirt a little bit skew with, but I could just open the collar a little bit, pull this back there. But for the moment, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start introducing a little bit more variety to the hair, hit those highlights in the hair just a touch more. Work on this, the edge of the hair first. And then if we have time, I can always go back in. So try and keep a certain sense of ambiguity to, to hairlines, both in the external contour and the interior. Keep a nice soft hairline. You'll be amazed how soft one can go with the hairline and it still register as sharp. And a little highlight band coming down there, probably a little bit too, yep, a little bit too white, which is turning him slightly gray. So we just have to knock them back a little bit. Maybe we can even soften and tone them just a bit more. but we start to get an indication of the hair turning over. What I'd normally sort of do to try and the last couple of, you know, five minutes or so, I'm just looking at edges, atmosphere. Is there anything jumping out, which I don't think is quite working, which needs to be changed. So I think I could probably, so you're looking basically at edges. When I say atmosphere, I mean how the figure relates to the, you know, to the, to its outside world, to the background. So edges being the interior, atmosphere being the relationship between the, the subject and the background, making sure that works. And again, obviously all these things, you can keep working on them until you get to a much more sort of rendered or quote unquote finished look, but the process is always pretty much the same. You're working on these larger shapes. You're keeping the light and the shadows simple and actually just working out the shadow edges. And yes, as you get further on, those shifts are smaller, which is why it seems like you're going into more detail, but actually what you're working on is, is the same. So I'm just going to knock this lowest part back very slightly. Probably made it very slightly warm there, but so I should have used a bit more, more black and white and a little bit less umber. But again, that's something which can easily be corrected. So just making the last couple of little adjustments before I'll call this one quits. Now what I might do, add a little bit of, add the odd rogue hair to the, to the contour. Give that hair a little bit of life. You don't want sort of perfectly quaffered hair constantly on your, on your painting because hair does move. If you have hair which is too sharp, 
when it comes to both edges, external and internal edges, often you end up looking more as if you've got a sort of Lego man's haircut on rather than the sort of more naturalistic lost and found edges that we see not only in nature, but in those old master paintings, which we love so much. So I'm going to leave it here for now. But like I said, is feel free to always push your work as much as you want to. There is no definitive finishing point. So it's very much down to your sense of finish, your desires, really. <laughs>